Did you know that curry contributes more than five billion dollars to the UK's economy annually? It's a dish that the British brought over from their colonization of India. Or that Dutch noodles, a dish eaten in Holland, is actually a version of bami goreng, an Indonesian dish that the Dutch adopted during colonization. Or that bread, now very popular in Japan, was actually adopted from the Portuguese. But colonialism didn't just lead to the adoption of new recipes, dishes, and flavors. Colonialism violently altered the way people lived, and food was used as a tool of colonization. Here are three examples of how. Christopher Columbus first landed in the Americas in 1492. As the Spanish began to colonize parts of Latin America, they came into contact with the Maya, Aztecs, and other indigenous groups. These groups had a thriving agriculture and were growing everything from pumpkins and chilies to avocados. But the Spanish, whose diet was mainly bread, meat, and wine, saw the indigenous diet as inferior, because they believed non-Europeans were inferior, and because the poor generally ate root vegetables in Spain. In fact, Christopher Columbus even suggested that Europeans in the Americas were dying because they lacked healthy European foods. The only meat available was guinea pig, and the Spanish associated it with Indians. And so Europeans brought domesticated animals such as cows, sheep, and pigs on their second ship in 1493. There were no natural predators, and the Spanish allowed them to graze over indigenous land and eat whatever crops they wanted. These traditional farm animals grew to crazy numbers, and the price of meat fell. But the rise of the meat industry actually contributed to the decline of the locals. The animals were eating their crops, and their land was also confiscated so the Spanish could grow grapes and wheat. The indigenous people became malnourished and even starved until they began to consume European foods for survival. Spanish women also perpetuated the colonization of food in the Americas. After establishing colonies, the Spanish crown began sending wives with their settler husbands. Indigenous women were employed as nannies, cooks, and maids. Spanish women instructed indigenous women on how to prepare and perfect Spanish cuisine, and so reproduced colonial food practices. The American bison is now one of the U.S.'s national animals, but British settlers drove the bison to near extinction. They believed that the extermination of the buffalo was a solution to the Indian problem. To control and colonize the land, they needed to control Native Americans and put them in reserves. And the easiest way to do this was to cut off their major source of food. Bison were hunted for their meat, and skins were used for tents. And so, bison were mercilessly hunted by British settlers and left on the plains to rot. At one point, there were 30 million bison on the plains. And by the end of the 19th century, there were only a few hundred left in the wild. Today, there are 20 to 25 thousand bison left. Making Native American food insecure eventually led to many tribes becoming resigned to reserves. When the British came to Australia, they displaced the indigenous Aboriginal community. Aboriginals were forced off their land into reserves, and among other things, lost access to their hunting and fishing grounds. Their healthy indigenous diets were substituted with unhealthy Western foods. Up until the 1960s, settlers used rations as a way to pay and control Aboriginals. The rations were composed of white flour, sugar, tea, and alcohol. As a result, the Aboriginal community saw a rapid growth of disability and chronic illness. Today, Aboriginals are twice as likely to have disabilities or chronic illnesses as non-indigenous Australians. In the 21st century, foods, flavors, and dishes are spread across the world because of colonization and globalization. While institutional colonization has ended, the legacies of colonialism have not. And so, while it's difficult to discern who owns what dish or what it's been inspired by, cultural appropriation is very much alive. It happens when a dominant culture adopts the cultural customs of a non-dominant culture without understanding or respecting the sensitivities of it, and sometimes even profiting from a food culture that isn't theirs. Like white food bloggers announcing their discovery of a new superfood that's been eaten for hundreds of years in other cultures, or restaurants with white hosts and brown cooks, or white chefs marketing biryani or burritos, which at times has more to do with white people profiteering from people's heritage than a healthy cultural exchange. Food is identity, and food is power, and the legacy of imposing diets has had real and devastating consequences for millions.